Welcome to Cut Up, a video series where I talk about specific scenes in movies and cut them up or just make fun of Tom Hanks' hair. This time we're talking about the Robert Langdon trilogy of The Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, and Inferno, based on a book series written by Dan Brown. In the films, Robert Langdon is played by Tom Hanks, who's accompanied by a different set of love interests and haircuts in every film. Which is all I really remember hearing about with this first movie. Everyone was talking about how bad Tom Hanks' hair was in this. I don't know, what do you think? Personally, I would have loved to see this look on him in Forrest Gump. Sorry I had a fight in the middle of your Black Panther party. Anyway, Robert Langdon is a fictional character, and you could tell he's a fictional character right away because he's a Harvard professor of art history and symbology. It's like if you lied at a dinner party about what you do, and you literally just made up something on the spot. I love it when they need to make a character smart, so they just say, Harvard, and then all of a sudden he's a genius. Also, yeah, symbology, not a thing. It's just really lazy writing. But we're not here to talk about how lazy the writing is in this series. We're here to talk about presentation. presentation. Full disclosure, I've never read the books, no thanks, so we're only gonna be talking about the movies here. The movies seem to follow a simple formula. Go to a new location, find out just enough information to know where to head to next, the police or bad guys will surround the building, and then Tom Hanks and the love interest magically get away. Repeat. The only thing that really changes from movie to movie, besides the hair, is the way the audience has presented the clues. So I've compiled some clue collecting scenes from The Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, and Inferno, and we're gonna see how this series evolved with its clue showing. First, there's The Da Vinci Code, released in 2006. As the saying goes, a picture says a thousand words, but which words? <laughs> In all these movies, they had to solve a problem. How do we make the exposition in the clue finding interesting? You can't just have your main characters looking at a painting, searching for clues in a blockbuster film. It needs to be interesting. There has to be some flair. It needs drama and running. So. How do you present these clues in an interesting way? In The Da Vinci Code, they do a lot of different things to make it exciting. The mystery really starts in The Da Vinci Code when Robert Langdon is shown a dead guy with a pentagram painting in blood on his chest and a crumpled up note with numbers on it next to him. They discover an anagram on the floor using a black light, which leads them to the Mona Lisa, which has blood by it, and another anagram that Tom Hanks, sorry, Robert Langdon, decodes using his beautiful mind powers. That leads them to a painting that has a key behind it. Oh, and I forgot to tell you that there is a security guard walking around, raising the stakes this whole time. But that leads to nothing because he loves art so much that he's willing to give up his gun for it, not to be harmed. Méfiez-vous. J'ai jamais vraiment aimé cette peinture. Listen up, this will only take a second. Oh, jeez. So, the movie takes a lot of liberties with reality to present information to us in an interesting way. Like when they show us the crypt text. They show that if you try to open it without the correct code, that it'll break a container holding vinegar that will dissolve the paper inside. It's pretty cool, even if they stole this shot from the Fast and the Furious. Go! Then, when this movie is literally changing Jesus' backstory, it's presented to us via an amazing PowerPoint. It looks like he's doing all of this on the fly. Does he do this for a crowd and now it's just uh, us? Why does he have such an elaborate setup? Who's seeing these flashbacks? Are they a part of the presentation? Does Ian McKellen play a wizard in all of his movie roles? Is he a wizard in this? You know what, don't worry about it. All you need to know is that you've been lied to and there's a mystery to solve. 
There are just a lot of jumps in logic and how the universe works. It's just easier if you watch it and believe that magic is real in this universe because it's clear that Robert Lang Lang has magic powers. He's reading glowing codes. He has young wizard hair. He can mix the past and the present like a time wizard when he explains things. She could see this, right? Otherwise, who is it for? Either way, it's clear they went out of their way to make sure that this seemed interesting and tried to add some flair. It's really just a lot of pomp and circumstance mixed with tension, but it's the best the series has to offer. You are the heir. The end of the bloodline. You are the last living descendant of Jesus Christ. I don't think so. <laughs> let's move on to Angels and Demons, released in 2009. So let's get this out of the way. The hair is gone. This one still has a big budget feel to it, but the clues aren't presented nearly as cool. I mean, he literally gets a clue from a tour guide who just happens to say any questions. It's a crypt. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Did Raphael Santee ever design a chapel with an ossuary annex and an angel figure commissioned by the Catholic Church? I'm sorry, I, I can only think of one. One is good. That is not the appropriate response in this situation. She should have said, All right, that concludes our tour. Any questions? Did Raphael Santee ever design a chapel with an ossuary annex and an angel figure commissioned by the Catholic Church? I'm sorry, sir. I was not talking to you. I have no idea who you are. Um, look, if you have any questions, you can come on our next tour. It's at one. One is good. For other parts, it's just not as interesting as the original. Statues literally just point Bob Langdon in the direction he needs to go. Then he has to look at a bunch of old books to find out some info. But don't worry, audience. It's not the hard books. It's the kind with a lot of pictures. Is this getting boring? What happens if everything was red? Less boring? No. Okay, okay. Uh, don't worry, we got some cool stuff. What happens if Robert Langing Dons was also a superhero who can dive into the world's deepest fountain and MacGyver a scuba system to save a man's life? That's basically how we're presented stuff in this. The clues themselves aren't presented cool, but information is told during or directly after action sequences. We also get that Fast and the Furious shot again, but this time it's to find out there's a new pope. Finally, let's take a look at Inferno, released in 2016. Yes, there is a third film in the series. I was surprised to find that out too. And this one, oh, oh boy, there is a steep drop off to how clues are presented compared to the first two films. The first clue is revealed to us via a tiny flashlight. Who stores vital information in something like this? Isn't that just something you could buy at a museum? I'm sorry, but you showed us magic PowerPoint that infiltrates your mind. You're not going to excite me with a literal children's toy. You know what? That's just the first one. That one's out of the way. Let's see what the next one is. The next clue. Oh, do you guys remember when I said you can't just have your main characters looking at a painting, searching for clues in a blockbuster film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I meant to say was you shouldn't have your main character just looking at a painting because of course you can. And to prove it, that's what they did in the film. Just looking up at a painting. Not even a cool shot of it. Next clue. After Tom Hanks does the weakest unlocking technique I've ever seen. Seriously, what is he even unlatching here? When does it unlock exactly? I mean, come on, we're just going through the motions here. I gotta move on. Next clue is literally them looking up a Wikipedia article on their phone. To be fair, they did do this in the first film. They used a search engine on a phone, but you know what? It sucked then too. The next information we get is how we get most of our info in Inferno, and it's given to us via a flashback triggered by a random sound. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, Professor Robert L. to the Angden has amnesia in this thing. I mean, that's just good writing right there. What better way to develop your character three films in than to completely stop all progress? Has anyone ever gone to see the third film of a series and said, 
Hey, you know what? I really hope my favorite main character has amnesia. No, it's awful. And it's the main source of how we get our information in this. The next piece of the puzzle is given to us again by a tour guide. They're literally just sightseeing now and hoping that the mystery unravels itself. You know, I'm starting to think that maybe I'm Harvard professor material. I can accost tour guides and Google stuff. The rest of the clue finding is just more of the same. Robert Landon remembers something or someone tells him the answer he needs. Most of the time, they're just kind of bumbling around trying to make it look like they're accomplishing anything, but it's all just given to them. Like in this scene, they try to make it look like they're accomplishing something. He puts his ear to the stone, he says some stuff, he hears some sounds, but then this guy's just like, oh yeah, I know the place. And they're like, Take us there. What was that all about? Also gross, get your face off the ground. What happened to the pageantry? Where's the magic? Robert Don Lang used to save people's lives. Now the guy can't even get up an eight foot wall without getting concussed. I mean, this thing must have a teeny budget, right? Let's take a look. Okay, the Da Vinci Code cost $125 million. They got a little bit more money for Angels and Demons. They went up to 150. Inferno, half that, 75 million. That is still a lot of money. So unless Tom Hanks took 74 million, I don't know where the rest of the money went for this film. You want to do something fine, then scream at the top of your lungs and invent and leave. If you love humanity, if you love this planet, you'd do anything to save it. The greatest sins in human history have been committed in the name of love. No one will look on this act and call it love. They'll be alive. What does it matter what they say about us? Hello? No one will look on this act and call it love. Miss Oniker? Hello, Miss Oniker? So that's the Robert Long Dong trilogy. I didn't really enjoy any of these films, but the first one really tried, and the second one still had that blockbuster movie feeling. But by the time they got to the third one, no one cared about this series anymore, including the people who were making it, and it shows. If you've read the books, let me know in the comments what you thought about them and the movies. I would also love to see a movie that does what this series did, but maybe even a little bit more insane, and I assume that's what National Treasure is like. And guess what? I've never seen any of the National Treasures, so if you've seen them, let me know in the comments if you think it's good enough for a cut-up. Make sure to subscribe, you monsters. Give me all your likes. Laters.